This morning, we're going to be doing things a little different. Uh, this past year, uh, some of the leaders in our, in our church have been on a bit of a vision quest. And it's, we know we want to follow Jesus, but what's his vision for us, specifically as a church? And so this morning, we're going to share about that, and we're going to celebrate that, and uh, we're going to begin by standing and uh, singing our first worship. One of the things that we talked about this year is identity. And that, I wasn't expecting that. And yet, for me, that was a great, one of the great joys of this past year was trying to learn who we really are and who God has called us to be. Um, you can do that as an individual, and that's a worthwhile exercise, but to do it as a church, you know, we believe the church is, is really one body, the believers of Jesus all over the world. But we recognize that God calls us to gather together in community with, with other followers of Jesus. And so I've always thought of these local churches like ours as simply one little corner of God's kingdom in a very vast kingdom. But each one of those little local churches all over this kingdom have a mission and have work to do. And God has created each of them unique. We have one thing in common, we're following Jesus. But who is the people that God has called to this corner of his kingdom? And what is our mission? The one thing I would say that I've learned about us is I've come to appreciate that if our church is nothing else, we're authentic. What you see is what you get. Sometimes that's a compliment and sometimes maybe not so much. But what you see is what you get. We're pretty down to earth, open. We want people to be welcome here, whether they're, whether they're somebody with three doctorates wearing a three-piece suit, or whether it's just somebody coming and coming in in jeans and a t-shirt or shorts and a t-shirt. We're authentic. We're people. We're the people Jesus has called to follow him and to share his hope with the world. And that's who we are. Um, I'm going to ask that some of the people who are on our vision team come and, and share a little bit about what we've been doing this past year. Um, some of the things that God has showed us. Um, and I've also encouraged them to, if they just have something on that, their heart or something they're thankful for about the past year, uh, it's okay to, to uh, in addition to reading what we've, uh, what we've uh, organized this morning, I want them to feel free to, to just share a testimony of uh, what God has been doing. And uh, I believe we're going to begin with Kim this morning. Jim's going to share about our identity. You should probably be careful about saying we can say whatever we want. <laughs> so there, um, you don't have to up there, okay. So there are, when we were going through this process, um, before I share what we actually talked about coming up with our identity, but um, we all kind of looked at each other like, is this really going to work? <laughs> and our leader took us through some exercises, and it was kind of surprising that none of us would very far apart, he would have us do groups and we'd put out words and thoughts and phrases or whatever and we found that we weren't too far off and we would take what was the most common theme through all of that, all of that. Um, and one of them that we had to do is who we are and it says we are, or what we want to be, um, a welcoming Christian community that cares about you. Uh, I don't really know if I can expand upon that because I, I think when I come to church and we're trying to think outside of ourselves too, if you go to some place you want to feel welcomed and you want to feel like you're a community, like you're a family, um, and we want to care about one another deeply. So, And then our church word, and this one I love the most, is hope. The world needs hope. We all have hope within our hearts because of what Jesus did for us. And we had put many words out there, and everything kept coming back to that one word, 
hope. And you'll see throughout some of the other things that we, we um, come up with that hope is repeated because we saw God gave us that word as our center and everything seemed to circle around that and come right back to that word re repeatedly. So we are a church of hope. Um, mission, building lives of hope together in Jesus. It's simple but powerful. Building lives of hope together in Jesus. Thank you. Janet's gonna share with us. We looked through, as we read through the Bible this past year, we came across one Bible story that just seemed to be who we are. And that story that God really spoke to all of our hearts about is in Luke chapter five, verses 27 to 30, 32, in it's Jesus calls Levi and eats with sinners. It's the calling of, um, of Levi, of Matthew. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large group of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? <clears throat> Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners, to repent. And another thing that we uh, talked about this year um, was what we felt like the word disciple meant. And um, as a vision team, we came up with that a disciple is a follower of Jesus who is actively seeking to become more like him by his grace. Thank you. Mike's going to come and share with us the vision God has given us. Just think of it. You can come to church wearing a three-piece suit. You can jeans and a t-shirt. You can wear overalls. What a vision that is, huh? Yes. <laughs> One of the things that struck me about this whole process was every time we were given a task, I'm thinking, ugh. But by the end of that task, it all came together, each one. Um, whether it was hope, as, as Kim mentioned, the word, or or other things that we did. I've been, part of me has said since we finished, we need to take down those posters on the wall back there, the big post-it notes. But when you see those, I'm reminded of the work that went in and, and the input that, that we all put into it. And, and everybody did work together. We all said things differently, but they all went in the same direction. And that was good to see. One of the things we worked on was our vision. And it says, in the next three years, we will be a church of growing disciples, meeting our community's needs with the resources God blesses us with. We can't do anything with, without God. And he's got to give us not only the people, but the resources. You know, it's, it's not one of these snap your fingers and, and God provides it. No, God provides what we need and we have to be open to where he leads us with what he gives us. Thank you. It's interesting how things come together. And this year has also had its challenges in the midst of seeking God's vision. One of those challenges is, you know, as far as the number of people, we're a small church. And we're not a wealthy church. And like everybody in this world, or at least in, in our area of the world, the prices of things like electricity and heating oil keep going up. And one of the things God showed me, and I think showed us, was it was time for me to be bivocational, which is a fancy word for uh, the pastor works a job outside the church in addition to being the pastor, just like the lay people in this church do. 
And so that, to me, I just, I read this vision and it talks about the resources God has given, given us. And I feel like this is a part of us achieving that vision. And I feel like God is really blessing us as, as we, as me and us as a church uh, adapt to that. I learned a new word this week. Bivocational means the pastor works a second job to help make ends meet. But there's a new word called co-vocational in which the pastor works a second job because he wants to be out in the community, meeting people and sharing life, just like the lay people do. Um, one of the things we worked on, which was very important is, as this little corner of God's kingdom, what are the things we value? And we worked hard to determine our values. And Herb is gonna come and share the first two values with us. Relationship with God. Human beings are created to love and be loved by God. We grow in our relationship with God through prayer, reading scripture and fellowship with his people, which is found in Genesis 1:26, 1 John 4, 19, Ephesians 3, 17 to 19, Romans 5, verse 8, and Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 to 40. And as I was looking at this before I came up, our relationship with God is very, very important. And I know from family, a lot of times have problems that don't serve God. They want to call on God when they have a need, but yet they're not, they don't want to change their lifestyle. And I said, God's not a genie in a bottle that you can just pull out whenever you want to and keep living a lifestyle that's not uh, right with God. And so relationship with God is very, very important. And I appreciate my relationship with God and I thank Him every day. Relationship with others. We are God's gift to each other to encourage, inspire, and help each other in life as we pursue God's mission in the world. John 15, verse 9, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, and Matthew 22, verses 35 to 40 which also came from the first with the relationship with God. And I think that's so important to have relationships with people. That's how we learn and how we grow. And I say all the time, if you don't come to church, if you don't have the Bible studies, you don't do that, it hinders your growth. And you really need that to really grow. And I'm thankful to God for that. Thank you, Herb. Now Tina has our next value one of the values that our team came up with is the importance of prayer prayer is the lifeblood of a relationship with God how can we have a relationship with him if we don't talk to him we approach God with both reverence for a holy God but also the intimacy of a child climbing onto a parent's lap the being that created everything that has been created calls us to talk with him Give thanks to him and bring our worries and fears to him. This, this was from Philippians 4, 6, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Matthew 6, 8, James 7, 16, Jeremiah 33, 3, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. Um, just a comment about, I think it's no surprise that we were so successful in our vision process because we started every meeting with prayer and there was prayer happening between them as well. I think Steve has the next one. Met by the Holy Spirit. We believe the Holy Spirit is document in the life of the church. He is a guiding, empowering presence that leads the church in its mission. We seek to listen, respond, and be obedient to the Holy Spirit's leading. <coughs> I 
this has been a kind of a last year and this year has been difficult for the family because of been having COVID and different things have happened that you know I I found that you know, I have I found that I have to lean on the Holy Spirit a lot more than I used to. Uh, you know, it's starting to be, well, I don't know how to explain it, but, you know, it's been a process dependent on the Holy Spirit. And, uh, Thank you, Steve. Now Denise is going to come and share. We're Bible-based. The Bible is the story of God and his people. It shapes how we view our identity our relationships and our purpose in this world. Timothy 3, 16, 17, and Romans 15, 4. I'm grateful to have the Bible to draw on the word of God for guidance and how we can become better disciples and better people here in this world. Thank you. It's amazing what how God can work through a group of people and uh, this past year has been a joy, and I thank you for listening to us this morning as we have shared some of what God has been showing us over the past year. Some of it is about who we are, some of it is about who we want to be, and some of it is about where God is leading us. But through it all, um, we have been blessed, and we are excited about what this coming uh, year has for us. These, these things we've worked on with identity and core values and our vision, they're not things you talk about just once and then set aside. They're part of the roadmap that God gives us to get where he's leading us. It, we do things. Churches do things. We do. There are actions that happen. Living a life following Jesus is a series of actions in addition to a relationship. And as we go forward as a church, we have to ask ourselves, do the things that we want to do, do the things we maybe don't want to do, does it reflect who we are, who God has created us to be as a church? Does it reflect our identity? And we may ask, these, this thing or that thing, does it align with our core values? These are the things that we find foundational. And so these core values have to guide who we are and what we do. And then we come back to the vision God has given us. What will help us achieve that vision? And things that won't help us achieve that vision, maybe they're things we're not called to do. But these, these things were a roadmap going forward to help us be who God has created us, called us, and equipped us to be. Over the past 11 years, I've prayed with a lot of different people in this church. I've prayed with people who are struggling with pain, physical illness. I prayed with people struggling with mental illness. I prayed with people struggling with addiction. I prayed with a person who was preparing to go to prison a few years ago. I prayed with a person preparing to, a couple of people preparing to go into ministry. I prayed with the wealthy. I prayed with the poor. I have prayed with Democrats and Republicans. I've prayed with Red Sox fans and Yankee fans. I've prayed with people from all different walks of life. Because, man, 
when you're seeking God together, none of the other stuff matters. It all gets set aside because we're all one and equal at the foot of the cross. The world is full of people from all walks of life, and so is our little community. When you follow Jesus, you never know where you're going to find yourself. Thankfully, the one thing we do know is that we know he'll always be with us. So we spent the past year seeking God's vision for our church. And he revealed this big picture of you that he has for us now. God's vision is a big picture of you. It's our turn to live out the details. He gave us the vision. We live out the details. As our vision team has been meeting together, we came up with one story in the Bible that seemed to sum up who we are and who God was calling us to be. And, and my, my wife, Jen, read that this morning. It's the story of the calling of Levi. Uh, if we'll go ahead and refresh our memories, it's worth reading more than once. It's found in Luke chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. And it's the story of people who had nothing in common and didn't particularly like each other, but they were all welcome with Jesus. It says in Luke 5, 27 to 32, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me. Jesus said to him. And Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were, were eating with him. But the Pharisee and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered, It's not the healthy who need a doctor. But the sick, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. One of the things that I value in this passage, and one of the things perhaps God's been teaching me about, when Jesus saw Matthew in that tax booth, he didn't give Matthew a command. The disciples weren't going to drag, the other disciples weren't going to drag. Let me back up for a minute because this will get confusing. Levi is also in other parts of the Bible called Matthew. Like many of the people we find in the Bible, they have more than one name. Um, like, uh, like Paul and, and uh, Saul. Levi and Matthew are the same person. So if I'm saying one or the other, no, I mean the same person. Levi is Matthew. Matthew is Levi. So Levi, if he had said, no, I don't want to follow you, Jesus, the other disciples weren't going to drag him out of his booth. Because that's not the way God operates. God invites us to follow him. He invites us. We can look way back to, to creation. Adam and Eve had things great. They walked with the Lord. He didn't make them. It was their privilege. And at some point they chose to, to go their own way and disobey God. And, and the world has never been the same. But God invites people. God says, come follow me. And then he leaves us free to accept or reject his invitation. What was Matthew, Levi, doing when he met Jesus? He was actually collecting taxes for the Roman Empire. He was collecting taxes for the Roman Empire that was occupying his nation, his home. This, this land of Judea, the people of Israel, this was a nation, God's chosen people, a proud nation, a proud people. And the Romans came in and just took over. 
They were being occupied by the Roman Empire. They were being forced to pay taxes to the Roman Empire. And Levi, he went right along with it. He was actually the one collecting taxes for him, or one of the ones collecting taxes for him. Now, the Jewish people would not have liked that. Levi's friends and neighbors, well, maybe I shouldn't say friends, Levi's neighbors would not have appreciated the fact that he was working with the Romans. In fact, the people of Israel considered anyone uh, who worked with Ro the Romans to be a traitor, to be the enemy. Levi was hated by his own people. He was cooperating with the enemy. He was getting wealthy off the backs of his neighbors. Of all the people Jesus could have invited to follow him, Levi perhaps seems like the most unlikely to follow Jesus. Yet Jesus knew that Levi was worth his time. Jesus knew that Levi was worth saving. Jesus knew that Levi was loved by the Father despite what he had done. And so Jesus called Levi to follow him. He extended the invitation. It's interesting in our modern, in the modern church, you know, we, we think about how do we, we know we want to reach those who need Jesus. How do we do it? When we're sharing our faith, we call that evangelism. When we're we're wanting to tell people about Jesus in hopes that they would follow him too. We call that evangelism. And over the years, there's been all these sorts of organized attempts to come up with plans of, here's how to do evangelism. And some of them have, have had great success. But it's interesting, if we ask ourselves, what was Jesus' method of evangelism? He didn't have a five-point plan. He didn't have formal evangelism training. So often I hear people say, well, I want to share my faith, but I don't know how. Well, you don't need a plan. You don't need training. Training can be helpful, but you don't need it. Jesus didn't have any formal evangelism training. What did Jesus do? What was Jesus' method of evangelism? It's two things, really. He showed sincere interest in a person and he showed compassion that was Jesus method of evangelism that was the secret he showed sincere interest in compassion he treated people all people as human beings and he gave invitations nobody was forced to follow Jesus in fact some people actually did say no to Jesus there's the story of the, the rich young man who Jesus invited to, Jesus to sell all your possessions and come follow me. And the man went away sad because he had many possessions. In Mark 6, we read that Jesus was rejected in his own hometown of Nazareth. And, and in that passage, Jesus says, prophets are honored everywhere except their own hometowns among their own relatives and their own households. In Luke 9, 53, Jesus was rejected by a, by a, a town. He was rejected by, a, um, by a, a town of Samaritans. And this prompted James and John to ask Jesus, if they should call down fire on that town that rejected Jesus. And of course, Jesus strongly rebuked them. No, don't call down fire on them. He invited them. They said no. And Jesus and the disciples moved on. He didn't force anybody. When Jesus gave invitations, sometimes he took no for an answer. And knowing what I know about Jesus, that had to be heartbreaking. It had to hurt. It had to be discouraging. It had to be frustrating, which perhaps is how we feel 
when people reject Jesus. It's frustrating. We want them to find the hope and the joy and the salvation that God has for them. But some people will reject him. When Jesus gave invitations, he sometimes took no for an answer. Now, getting back to Levi, Levi, Matthew, what was his response to Jesus' invitation? His response is pretty amazing. It's also pretty short to sum up. He got up, he left everything behind, and he followed Jesus. Notice that Jesus didn't, Jesus may have met him in the tax booth. Jesus welcomed Levi right there in the tax booth. But just Jesus didn't leave him in the tax booth. Jesus changed his life. An invitation to follow Jesus, by definition, it means leaving behind what's behind you and going forward following Jesus. Levi became a disciple. That's what we call a follower of Jesus. He became a disciple. And that word disciple is an interesting word. What is a disciple? It was shared earlier during our vision quest this past year. We came up with our own definition of disciple. Or I should say God's definition that he revealed to us. A follower of Jesus who's actively seeking to become more like him by his grace. That little tag at the end, by his grace, that's important. Because our desire, our hope is that as we follow Jesus, we will become more like Jesus. But we also recognize that of our own will and desire, we can never really become like Jesus. But we believe his grace at work in our hearts can mold us and shape us and help us to live and be more like him. Follower of Jesus actively seeking to become more like him by his grace. Does that describe you? follower of Jesus who is actively seeking to become more like him by his grace. Does that describe our hope for others? Does it describe our hope that anyone can become a follower of Jesus who's actively seeking to become more like him by his grace? Do we believe that anyone can become his? And then we get to this part of the story where Levi is excited that Jesus has called him to follow him, to be his disciple. And he throws this great party in his home. And who, who do we invite to a party? We, we invite our friends, our neighbors. And Levi being a tax collector, somebody who was looked down on by his community, somebody who was hated by his community. Most of his friends were people who were also hated by the community. But Levi had something to celebrate. Levi recognized that he was a sinner. Levi was humbled that Jesus said, come follow me. I don't care what you've done before. Come follow me now. And Levi was celebrating that Jesus changed his life. That is truly something to celebrate. When a sinner has their heart changed by Jesus, when they receive that, accept that invitation to follow him, it's worth celebrating. For Levi, he was celebrating that he was a human being who was hated and felt like an outsider, and now he had gained a new family. He was celebrating that he found hope. There's that word again, hope. He found his hope in Jesus. But then there, there were the Pharisees. There were those religious people who came. Whenever they show up in, in the Gospels, they always seem to be complaining about something. They're always complaining. This time they're complaining about Jesus and his disciples sharing a meal, celebrating with Levi and his friends. They were complaining about the company that Jesus kept. The Pharisees were these very prim and proper religious people who took great pride 
in how good they were at keeping the law. You know, the, we look in the Old Testament and we find the, the Jewish law had a lot of little bits and pieces to it. it. I believe it's 613 different laws that can be pulled out of the Old Testament. And man, the Pharisees, they were just going to follow them all right to the letter. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of them kind of did. But Jesus, on the other hand, was dining with tax collectors and sinners. People the Pharisees looked down on. People the Pharisees saw as not keeping all 613 or whatever it was laws. In our broken world today, who are the Levites that people complain about? Who are the Levites that we complain about? Jesus didn't come to save people who already had it all together. He came to save, he came to save sinners like you and I, and sinners like them or them, or whoever to you them is. This is a story about the righteous and the sinful, sort of. I'm, I was thinking, one of the questions I ask myself as I read this, were the sinners in this story really that sinful? Yeah. It says they were tax collectors and sinners. They really were sinful people. Jesus called Levi to follow him. But that didn't mean Jesus was justifying what he left behind. Jesus inviting Levi to follow him was, was no statement at all about collecting taxes for the Roman Empire. Most tax collectors had a reputation for being dishonest and taking some of the money for themselves, skimming off the top. And We don't know if Levi did that or not. Maybe, maybe not. It wouldn't have mattered to Jesus, and Jesus certainly wouldn't have, didn't justify that by saying, come follow me. He simply saw that this was a human being God loved, and he had something better in mind for him if he was willing, and he said, come follow me. So Jesus called Levi to follow him, but he didn't justify what Levi, Levi left behind. Jesus eating with sinners and tax collectors didn't justify the choices they were making. All it did was point out that God loved them too. These people who Jesus was eating with were exactly who he had come to save. Now what about the Pharisees? Were the Pharisees really that righteous? No, they weren't. They weren't. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Pharisees may have been extremely disciplined in keeping the law, but their reaction to Levi and his friends shows what was really going on in their hearts. It does no good to follow every rule right to the letter, every law right to the letter, and yet hate your neighbor. Because it's really what's going on in the heart that reveals what's going on in a person's life, mind and life and who they are. What good does it do to follow the exact letter of, of, of the whole law and yet neglect our soul? by hating those Jesus loves. <clears throat> In Matthew 15, 18, it says, yeah, Matthew, that Matthew, this Levi, the Matthew, the Levi who wrote the Gospel of Matthew. It says in Matthew 15, 18, what goes out of the mouth comes from the heart. And that's what contaminates a person in God's sight. We can do all the right things but our words tend to reveal our hearts, and it's our hearts that Jesus came to save. The Pharisees were saying, why does Jesus eat with those people? 
People, the Pharisees would never welcome. But with Jesus, they were all welcome. It's ironic that the Pharisees were complaining about the tax collectors and sinners, but the tax collectors and sinners weren't complaining about the Pharisees in this story. At some point in the story, uh, or rather, at some point after this story, those Pharisees, those tax collectors, those sinners, eventually Jesus was going to the going to go to the cross for all of them. And at the foot of the cross, they were all equal. And at the foot of the cross, we are all equal. Everyone was welcome with Jesus. The hardworking, overtaxed fishermen were welcome. At least one of Jesus' followers was a woman who had been set free from, from demons. One of his followers was a prideful mother and her two sons that she wanted to sit in places of honor in Jesus' kingdom, while her sons argued over who was really the greatest among them. The tax collectors were welcome, and even the Pharisees were welcome in Jesus' kingdom. They were welcome in what Jesus was doing. Jesus truly cared about those he came in contact with. And he welcomed them all. That didn't mean he agreed with them. Just that he welcomed them. And he valued them as human beings God loves. These people that Jesus welcomed. Those who followed him. It included the demon-possessed, the prideful, the greedy, the violent, the sexually immoral. It included people that God loved and Jesus came to lay down his life for. They were all welcome to talk, to share a meal, to work together, to care for each other. And it was Jesus' desire that they would leave behind their sinful past and find a new identity in him. That they would leave behind the road to destruction and step forward on the path of hope. And whether they chose to or not, they were still welcome to share a meal, to work together. They were still valued in God's eyes and they weren't given up on. The followers of Jesus became a welcoming, caring community. A welcoming community that cares about you, that has a nice sound to it, has a nice ring to it. So does building lives of hope together in Jesus. It's our new mission statement, but it's really an expression of God's mission for us. Building lives of hope together in Jesus. It's what Jesus was doing at Levi's house that day. Jesus brings people together. People from all sorts of people, from all sorts of backgrounds. People who can seem so different find they are united in Jesus. We've been talking about Levi, or Matthew, the tax collector, the one who had been helping the Roman Empire, the one who had been taking from his neighbors for the Roman Empire. We've talked about him a bit, but there's another disciple who followed Jesus. And truthfully, we don't know a whole lot about him. There's a disciple mentioned in the Bible um, named Simon, the zealot. There's a couple places in the New Testament where we find lists of Jesus' 12 disciples, his hand-picked leaders. We understand that Jesus had a lot of followers. In a sense, he had a lot of disciples. But he had these 12 who were his leaders. He had those 12 leaders who helped him to, to oversee the other disciples, to oversee what they were doing, the mission God had carried them on. Jesus chose leaders. Among his handpicked leaders, we find Levi, 
the tax collector from our scripture today, and we also find Simon the Zealot. We don't know a whole lot about Simon the Zealot, but we know he was a zealot. And we can look at history and see, what did that mean? Who were these people in Jesus' time and place called the Zealots? And why would I point him out this morning? Well, a tax collector and a zealot would have absolutely hated each other. And they would have both been welcome. They both were welcome with Jesus. They both followed Jesus. They worked together with Jesus. What did they have in common? Jesus changed their lives. You see, the zealots were essentially revolutionaries. They were people who were committed to violently overthrow the Roman Empire. They were people who committed acts of violence in an effort to make the Roman oppressors leave. And they wouldn't just attack Romans. They would violently attack Israelites who collaborated with the Romans. In other words, Simon the Zealot, before he met Jesus, he and his people wanted to violently attack people like Levi, who worked with the Romans. And yet, here Jesus calls Simon the Zealot and Levi the tax collector. And they are equal at the cross. They were both welcome at his table. They both left behind who they were and became brothers in Christ. Can you just imagine Simon the Zealot and Levi the tax collector working and living together as they followed Jesus? They would have been the most unlikely pair. They couldn't be more different from one another. But they had one thing in common. Jesus changed their life. Jesus gave them an invitation to follow him and their lives change forever. That's what Jesus does. Jesus welcomes everybody. Jesus invites us all to follow him. Jesus invites us all to, to leave behind the broken and troubled things of our past and to walk forward into a future with him, being part of a community united in Jesus. Who are we? What does God desire from us? From us? What's his vision for us over the next few years? God's been showing us. and It's been a long road to get here, but as I look back, I want to look at it now and go, oh, well, that's kind of simple. We're a welcoming Christian community that cares about you and we care about each other. We're followers of Jesus who live by one word, hope, hope in him. God has given us a mission, building lives of hope together in Jesus, building up each other, building up whosoever would follow Jesus. God has given us a vision for who we're going to become over the next three years. A church of growing disciples meeting our community's needs with the resources God blesses us with. That's who we're called to be. That's who God is shaping us to be. It's going to take a lot of prayer and a lot of hard work. And it's going to take a willingness to surrender everything to him. It's his church. It's his kingdom. And we're his people. And God wants to do something amazing in this little church. God wants to do something amazing in this little town. God wants to do something amazing in our lives. God wants to do something amazing in this world. When I talk about our church, I, I find myself often using the adjective little or small. And it's, it's true in one sense. But our impact, our ability to connect in one way or another with other people is a whole lot bigger than how many people are here on Sunday. 
It's amazing. We, we get to welcome people into our church community every Sunday over, over the internet. That's pretty amazing. I don't think being part of a church online is the best thing. I think it's the next best thing to being part of a church in person simply because we, we need each other. We need to care for each other. But you know what? There are a whole lot of reasons why people join us online. And those people, they, they make prayer requests. They say good morning in the comments on Facebook. They, they are trying to be part of our community in one way or another. They're part of the impact we make as a church. They're part of the church, to be honest. And it's amazing when we think about it. Because if we start thinking in terms of who do we impact, even in some small way here or there, we impact people in Africa. My son and I have joked that you can get like demographics on Facebook and most of our followers live in the United States, but the second biggest group of followers we have is people in the Philippines. So we, we've made an impact with somebody in the Philippines at some point in time. You never know what grows from a little seed. You never know what God is really doing. We never know, we will never know this side of heaven, the impact that this church really has. And I want you to know that you will never know this side of heaven, the impact that you have on the people God puts in your life. Sometimes it may seem like the littlest thing, but the littlest thing can mean so much to another. And sometimes, with God at work, it can change their life. Let us pray. Let us trust God. And we'll see what happens. But I believe God has good things in store to continue to use this church in this corner of his kingdom to his glory. May the God of endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude towards each other, similar to Christ Jesus' attitude. That way you can glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ together with one voice. God bless you and enjoy your afternoon.